Divine Truth Feedback Jesus, Mary and others give personal or group feedback to people who have asked for personal assistance. Jesus and Mary give answers to questions about love compensation, repentance, forgiveness and prayer. This feedback session was recorded on the 2nd of December 2015 in Willsdale, Queensland, Australia. This is part one. Hi everyone, I'm Mary and I'm here with Jesus and we're recording a, a Q&A session which is really a follow-up session to a bit of personal feedback that we gave yesterday yeah. that was in response to a forum post from a lady called Sandra and she asked about the topics of the law of compensation, the law of repentance, the law of forgiveness and we ended up discussing a lot about prayer as well. Yes. And uh, I, I should point out at that stage in the intro that, that actually this session is more like going to be a feedback session based on a number of questions that people who were in our audience yesterday wanted to ask us based on the discussion we had yesterday. So, so this is really a feedback session for, for a group of people who were listening in the audience yesterday. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's, that's right. So. Okay, so based on what we talked about yesterday, mm -hmm. we had three people um, helping with the filming yesterday, mm -hmm. and we finished and they had a lot of questions themselves. Yes. And we ended up having a great discussion. Mm. And from that, we all felt it would be great to share what we discussed mm. with everyone else. Mm -hmm. So that's where these questions come from. Yes, as usual, we should have been recording during the discussion. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I always say we should record everything now. <laughs> Okay, mm -hmm. so the first uh, couple of questions relate to obeying God's laws. And yesterday you really highlighted the point, a lot of points about obeying or disobeying God's laws. Yes, really, that's the exercise of our will, isn't it? We have a choice to obey or to disobey God's laws. And true obedience comes from the heart. So, so we've got to recognise that this is not obedience that's coming from your head or obedience that you try, you're trying to obey but actually that you feel like you want to obey, which is a very, very different state. You know, persons, a lot of people feel uh, guilt and shame and other feelings, and that causes them to feel like they have to obey mm -hmm. uh, or, or have to obey in order to avoid any penalties. But once you get to the point where you really want to obey, this is when you really understand love because a, a truly loving person wants to do the loving thing. And therefore, if they did the loving thing, they would never be breaking any of God's laws anyway. Yeah. So it's really quite simple. We don't have to know the, every single law. We just have to have a strong desire to love. And if we have a strong desire to love, we will obey, but it won't feel like obedience. It will feel like it's, a, it's an expression of our desires instead. Yeah. 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 Okay. So the first question is, did you mean that if we don't break any of God's laws, we will no longer suffer? Yes, yeah, definitely. So all suffering is the result. And, you know, and I'm talking about the pain and suffering that occurs physically as well as emotionally. And also in the soul, there's a lot of suffering that exists in the soul and the spirit body as well as a result of sin. And once you stop sinning, obviously, all pain and suffering also ceases to be created. It, of course, you have to release any past compensation for sin mm -hmm. in order for all pain and suffering to cease. Mm -hmm. So, but if you stop sinning immediately, then obviously you're not creating any new pain and suffering. Yep. You're only dealing with the old pain and suffering that you've yeah. that you created in the past. Uh -huh. and, and then, but if you actually cease uh, sinning, and on top of that, go through the process of repentance that God's designed for you to clear away the cause of sin. Once you've removed the cause of sin, after that, there is no pain and suffering ever again. Yeah. And, that, and that point, usually, if you're, if you're drawn into your relationship with God as well, is also a very similar time as to when you become at one with God. So, mm -hmm. so after that, there is no pain and suffering at all, physically, emotionally, spiritually. There's no damage in the soul left anymore. Everything is working perfectly. Your body works perfectly. Your mind works perfectly. Your mind's no longer limita limited by the 10% rule, if you could call it that. You know how uh, scientists feel we only use 10% of our brain or less. Yeah. Um, that's not the case anymore. And in fact, the brain almost becomes a superfluous 
part of our anatomy in some ways. It still handles all of our physiological functions, but the majority of our thinking is done at the soul level, at the, mm. uh, and that is transmitted through the spirit body's mind into the physical body's brain. So the reality is also all of your th thoughts are perfect, as well as all of your actions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so basically what you're saying, if we tie that into your opening comments there mm -hmm. about ob obedience with the, the law, actually a heart state where we, we desire that obedience, not we're just complying because we're afraid or worried. Yes, well, compliance just because you're afraid is a sin in itself. Yeah. And compliance just because you're ashamed or guilty is a sin in itself. Yeah. Um, the reality is a person who truly understands God's laws uh, and understands that they're loving, mm -hmm. w would want to know them and want to engage them and feel that desire as a passionate desire from their heart. And once they are in that state, they no longer feel like they are obeying because often the connotation on earth about obedience is reluctant obedience, yes. you know, where you, you yeah. obey, but only because you have to. <laughs> yeah. um, that's not how you feel anymore once you're in that state. You obey because you know not only is it going to bring happiness to yourself and others, but also that it's the most loving thing to do, and that's mm -hmm. why you, you, you obey. Mm -hmm. And you don't any longer make justifications for unloving behaviour inside of yourself. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's the first part of it, the obedience, the, the, the desirous, willful obedience. Yes. And then you said, then coupling that with the process of repentance, then we see no more suffering. Correct. So you have to, to have no more suffering, not only do you have to stop sinning right now, mm -hmm. but you also have to pay the penalties of past sins. And, and this is what I feel most people forget, is that you might stop sinning right now, but have no desire to work through the penalties of past sins. And if that's the case, then obviously pain and suffering will not cease until you have a recognition of the sin and awareness of sin and awakening to the sin. And then you work through the issues of repentance and forgiveness with regard to the sins. Yeah. Um, it, and so you could stop sinning right now, but your pain and suffering cannot cease until not only do you stop sinning, but you also have paid for your past sins. Yes. Right? yes. And this is why many people arrive in the spirit world. They realize that they've sinned, so they, start, they stop sinning and they just deal with their past sins uh, or they stop choosing to sin and they mm -hmm. deal with their past sins. And as they deal with their past things, sins, then they progress. Mm. And eventually their past sins are no longer, they're no longer, um, they've been forgiven for such sins. Uh, through the process of either forgetfulness, which is the law of compensation process, or the process of repentance, which mm -hmm. is the divine love process. And uh, either one of those processes results in eventually you being forgiven for the majority of, of your sin, I say for the first one, mm -hmm. because there's still one sin that you commit when you go through the law of compensation process without involving God in the repentance process, and that is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Mm. So until... So every person who's perfected in natural love but has not become perfected in their relationship with God is still sinning, mm -hmm. but they're sinning against the Holy Spirit. This is the reason why they cannot progress beyond the sixth sphere. This is also the reason why they cannot become at one with God. Mm. And so really you're saying there that a part of receiving divine love means that you're already engaging repentance, the laws of repentance and forgiveness. And in particular, the law of repentance about about rejecting God's love. Right. <laughs> which is the biggest sin you can commit, yeah. really, because yeah. it has the most long-term detrimental effect on yourself and others. Mm -hmm. so, so if you are involving yourself in the process of natural love and you're working your way through your compensation for your sins, you can become perfected in natural love, but you still are sinning. Mm -hmm. But now you are sinning not against your brothers and sisters anymore, because you've perfected that part of your love, yep. but you're still sinning against God because mm -hmm. you're still sinning in regard to the rejection of the Holy Spirit, the, re the rejection of God's truth, the rejection of God's love. So there, there are still significant ways in which you're sinning, but, but you're no longer having the penalty of having sinned against God's children, uh, others or, or of God's children, mm -hmm. or sinned against yourself in terms of how you've treated yourself. Yeah. Yep. In yep. terms of either being you know, feeling that you're uh, better than other people, superior, or feeling inferior or not as good as other people. From b both of those viewpoints, from God's perspective, are sins. Yeah. 
and you clear that process away with the law of compensation or with the law of repentance. But eventually you get to the point where unless you engage God, you are continuing to sin in one particular way, and that mm -hmm. is the sin against the Holy Spirit. And is it correct to say that all suffering comes from sin or having some sin will result in suffering? Is there a direct correlation? Of course, yes. And, and, and here we need to also clarify too that <clears throat> even though the spirits that exist in the sixth dimension of the spirit world, the sixth sphere, have released themselves of all of their sins regarding natural love, and they, they have yet to release themselves of all of their sins regarding God's love. Now, as a result of that, there is the penalty, and the penalty is they cannot progress beyond the sixth sphere. Mm -hmm. They cannot enjoy the beautiful advantages of having the relationship with God and the blissful relationship that's possible with God cannot be enjoyed by those particular spirits. So, so there is still a penalty. Mm -hmm. It's just that many of those spirits don't recognise the penalty because they don't recognise our relationship with God. Yeah. But, but there is still really a penalty, and that penalty remains until the transition between the seventh and the eighth sphere. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, yes, if you, it, it, with that as a proviso, if you release all of your sin yep. and you release all of the penalties for your past sin, yep. all pain and suffering ceases, right? Except if you are only on the path towards natural love and not on the path towards God's love, there is still the penalty mm -hmm. associated with the sin against the Holy Spirit. So we might call that a type of suffering or a, it's, a, it's a limit to our pleasure or enjoyment. Well, the irony of that type of suffering is that the people who are in the place of the sixth dimension or the sixth sphere do not believe it to be a place of suffering. Mm -hmm. But once they progress to the seventh sphere and look back at the state they were in, they do believe it to be a place of suffering. Got to. And, and in fact, many six fear spirits suffer from two primary issues. The first issue is that they are not aware of their own immortality. Mm -hmm. In other words, they, they still worry about whether they can die as a soul. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they are not aware of the benefits of their relationship with God. Yeah. They, they also have generally a feeling of dissatisfaction after a period of time. So nothing seems to satisfy them after a period of time. And I'm talking usually thousands of years of living in that state. Often they get to this point where nothing seems to satisfy them. And as a result of that, there is a feeling of dissatisfaction. Mm -hmm. They also concerned about the fact that they're not progressing. Mm -hmm. And they know that continual progress is, uh, continual change is the, a, a natural law of the universe. And they see themselves not continually changing and they begin to worry about what that is going to mean in mm -hmm. their future. Mm -hmm. So there's quite a number of things that concern them, mm -hmm. but they are not that aware of those particular things because they're no longer paying the hellish penalties, if you like, <laughs> the, the really harsh penalties of sinning against their brothers and sisters. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so if we go back to the question, <coughs> do you mean that if we don't break any of God's laws, we will no longer suffer? So essentially you're saying yes. The truthful answer to that is yes, because to not break any of God's laws, you have to also have a relationship with God. You, you engage the laws, the highest laws. Of course. Yeah. So in other words, if you're truly not going to break any of God's laws, you must be on the divine love path at some point in your yeah. future. Yeah. And, and if you're not, then you are breaking an, a number of God's laws. And one of them in particular, the highest one, is this law of regarding the sin against the Holy Spirit, the law of love. You're breaking that still, the yeah. law of God's love. Yeah. And so it's one of the biggest things you can break. And as a result, any person who breaks that particular law will suffer some penalties, whether they're conscious of those penalties or not, is usually the problem. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, most people on earth are not really conscious of the penalty of their own sin, even with large sins. Mm -hmm. so, so you can see why a person may not be conscious after all that progression, they still might not be conscious of this particular large, the, the largest sin of all. Yeah, mm. yeah, we're always in a process of uh, becoming more sensitive, aren't we? That's the way the laws are designed to exactly, assist yes. us yeah. in that. Yeah. But the, uh, the progress towards natural love is often the sensitivity to the sin and the, and the law of compensation 
grinds you into <laughs> submission to the yeah, law, yeah. whereas the laws regarding divine love are about our desire to do them, mm -hmm. like ha developing a desire within ourselves to do it. And this is, uh, and this is why in our assistance groups we're covering in the very first session developing my loving will, you know, yeah. my will to love and to grow and to change. Um, that's that's a very different sort of a de development than reluctantly <laughs> gro growing and changing because the law forces you, the, the law of compensation in particular, and other laws, law of attraction and other laws force you into change. So um, you can do it reluctantly or, or with desire. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you do it with desire, you'll probably highly likely find God's path, the, the way to God. If you do it with reluctance most of your life, then it'll be a long time before you find your way to God. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, second question then is, yeah. how can we stop breaking God's laws? Well, uh, obviously the answer to that is stop sinning. Because yeah. <laughs> a sin is breaking God's laws. Yeah. You stop wanting to break God's laws. That's mm -hmm. how you stop breaking God's laws you stop wanting to. Yeah. Now, uh, the more complex answer, of course, is you can't do that intellectually because the desires are within you to break law oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And these desires come from addictions and facade based uh, reasoning that d has been developed over many, many years inside of you. And, and obviously they have to be removed yeah. as an emotion. They have to be removed in order to truly stop the desire to sin. Mm -hmm. So, so this is where the emotional part of a development comes in. There, there needs to be the removal of the belief systems that are emotional, removal of the, of, the, of the feelings and emotions that are out of harmony with love. They are the causes of our sin. Mm -hmm. So obviously we need to remove the causes of our sin in order to stop sinning. Yes. Now this is where, again, the law of compensation is, is geared towards removing the cause of sin mm -hmm. by listing the sin in front of you and presenting it to you. And sooner or later you become aware of that and then it shows you, you, you have sinned again and this is the penalty and this is what you've done and this is the harm you've committed and so forth to others and yourself. And those particular sins will be continually listed in front of you until you've paid the penalty mm -hmm. for them. Now obviously there's still the penalty of the sin regarding the Holy Spirit and that is not listed in front of you. Mm. It's only felt mm. as a problem inside of the soul at some point in your future. Then there's the second aspect to it, which is this process of releasing those particular feelings. Mm -hmm. And obviously that's going to require humility, a desire to feel, a desire to release. And you can do that with God. Uh, or by yourself. Mm -hmm. If you do it with God, it is much, much quicker because you can engage the laws of repentance and forgiveness. Yeah. And there is a major reason why we need to do it with God. And maybe it's related to the, next, the next question. question. So yeah. I'll, I'll leave that for the next question. <laughs> but um, it, it is a, there are very logical reasons why we should in, and need to and, and actually have to involve God in the process if we truly are going to remove all sin from mm -hmm. ourselves. Mm -hmm. If we go th down the natural love way with the law of compensation, we will eventually become sinless when, when it comes to the way in which we treat our brothers and sisters. But unfortunately, we will still be sinning against God in many ways, actually. And, uh, and it requires us becoming sensitive to that sin before we will actually change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned the law of compensation lists all these things in front of us. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify what you mean by that? Yes, uh, um, if you truly allow yourself to feel, you will actually feel when you have done the wrong thing. And the reason why this is, is because, and this is something that most people find uh, only when they pass into the spirit world, is that once they become aware of the concept of sin, their sins are actually listed that in inside of them as a part of their soul's project, own soul's projection. Mm -hmm. And so they, their soul itself has a record of every sin. And in fact, you can ac access that record if you truly desire to and, and, and list those uh, particular sins and have them listed before you. Obviously, people who have sinned a huge amount on earth have a very, very, very long list mm. uh, to address. Like someone like Nero in our, in, you know, near our first century life had a terribly long list to address. And if it wasn't for him finding in the, 90, in the 20th century God's love, 
he, he would probably be doing it for many, many, many millennia to come, mm -hmm. uh, paying the penalties through the law of compensation. Yeah. So, you know, for people who have sinned greatly, obviously the, there is a large deal of mercy in the law of forgiveness and repentance yeah. that God has created. Yeah. And, uh, and this, is some, this is one of God's characteristics, this deep level of mercy. Mm. And we have a merciful God who forgives our sin, even though we probably don't deserve to <laughs> be forgiven. When I say deserve to, you know, if it comes, if we, if we consider all the actions of our sin, which is something we'll discuss later, um, you'll real, we'll re come to realise that it's probably impossible to pay the, all the penalties of what we have done. Mm. Mm. Okay, but you're saying that the list that the law of compensation provides is a literal list when we're in our spirit form, mm -hmm. but essentially we're being it's given soul. being given that list via our souls. You uh, have to want to see it, and if you want to see it, you'll see it here on earth as well as in the spirit world. Yep. Yep. So you have to want to see it, though. Mm -hmm. Most people don't. In fact, all people that live on earth generally don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just clarifying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's move on to the laws of repentance and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Got lots to lots to cover here. Mm -hmm. So, first question: Can I repent and forgive on my own, or, in other words, is it essential to involve God when I forgive and repent? And I've got some examples written here as well. If you well, let, let's look at the principle firstly. When we sin we do a large number of things to our own self and to others. Now, the things that we do to ourselves, we can obviously work our way through and deal with. But the things we do to other people are much more difficult for us to work our way through mm -hmm. because we can't change the effect we've had on that particular person. Mm -hmm. So this, if you think about it, this applies to every parent on the planet. Every parent on the planet has sinned towards their children and, and as such have broken many of God's laws of love towards their children. And, and as a result of those particular sins, th those children have been damaged now for, by the sin itself and by the action taken that was unloving towards them. Now, the parent can work their way through all of their own sins by repenting and being sorry for them and even expressing their sorrow to their children and all sorts of things like that. But, but at the end of the day, that doesn't mean the ch child will, will actually benefit from that. It will help the child benefit, mm -hmm. but the child may choose to not benefit from that action. So that means the parent is left with this feeling that no matter what the parent does, it cannot fix the sin that it committed towards that child. Yeah. And that applies to all of our sins, actually. We can't repair them. For example, if we took the life of an animal, there is no way we can give it life back. Mm -hmm. That animal, that particular animal, has now, is now dead, and we've probably eaten its flesh or whatever. Um, there's no way that we can get all of that material back and make the animal again mm -hmm. and put that, you know, that spirit body of the animal back in that animal. It's impossible to do. It's actually a physical impossibility. So just in eating an animal, once we recognise the true sin of it, we would realise that we've taken life without the ability to even give it back, mm -hmm. without the ability to, to, to improve upon the situation, no matter how repentant we are. And, you know, it applies even more so, obviously, if we've taken human life. Mm -hmm. if it, imagine if you've raped a person or harmed a person sexually in some way, you know, through child abuse or rape, you know, how do you then reverse what you've done? It's almost, it, it's almost impossible. Well, I feel it is impossible to reverse what you've done to the person. The person themselves needs to go through some yeah. things to reverse it. And if they choose not to do that, then, then basically there's nothing you can do to fix the problem aside from going through some things yourself. Mm -hmm. But you, that still doesn't fix the problem for the person. Yeah. So, so once you fully recognise the seriousness of sin, you'll realise that actually it's impossible, no matter what you do, it's actually impossible for you to reverse the effects of the sin for everybody that you've affected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I backtrack slightly? No. Can I just say one more thing before you do? Oh, uh, sure. There, what I want to say is that with God, all, because we, it's impossible for ourselves, it's, it's only possible with God. 
And once you fully recognize the seriousness of sin, you come to see that it's actually impossible for you to fully compensate for everything that you've actually done. Mm -hmm. And it's impossible for you to, to, to fix what you've done and repair what you've done. And, and only God can do those things. Now, once you realize that, yep. and you truly understand that, you will begin to see the necessity of involving God in the process. Mm -hmm. So this is an actual logical thing, if you think about it. There is no way that you can repair all of the damage you've ever done in your life, no matter what you do. No way that you can repair it, no way that you can fix it, no way that you can go back in time and reverse it all. Mm -hmm. right? The only person that can fix any of the, all and all the damage is God. And God's love is the mechanism by which God uses to fix all of this damage. That being the case, it makes logical sense that unless you connect to God through this process of forgiveness and repentance, you will never fully be able to fix all the things you've ever done. Mm. And, and also, since you will never be able to fully fix what all, uh, things you've ever done anyway, you need God to fix the rest of it for you because you can't do it. Only God can do it for the other people. You can't do it for the other people. Only God can. Yeah. And once you recognize that, then you will understand the necessity of involving God mm -hmm. in the process. Mm. Mm. Now we can rewind. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's a few things that I want to clarify from what you said. Sure. For our listeners. Um, if we go right, right, right back. Mm -hmm. What you've shared previously about the way that we forgive and the way that we repent. The way we forgive is that we, exp and this is where I would like clarification. Mm -hmm. So for example, if I've had a lot of um, causal pain mm -hmm. inside of me through my relationship with my mother, mm -hmm. And I, I've heard divine truth teachings and I think, well, the way to heal that within myself is to forgive my mother. And the way to forgive is to release all of the pain, that causal pain mm -hmm. that was generated in that relationship. By my mother. By my mother mm -hmm. in that relationship. Yep. Can't I do that on my own, for example, without God? I would say for the most people, it's highly unlikely they'll do it on their own. So what happens with God? Well, let, let's look at what happens on their own first. Because yeah. <laughs> um, I feel you're jumping ahead every time you ask a question. So, so let's look at what's happening with, uh, on our own first. If we go through the emotional process of forgiving my, mo uh, my mother for whatever she's done, I need to feel what she's actually done. To feel what she's actually done, I need to see the truth of what she's done. I need to see the sin in what she's done. I need to have an awakening to the sin of what she's done mm -hmm. and then feel my way through that particular process emotionally. Now, the average person on the planet won't do that. They just won't. They'll find, firstly, the denial of truth is so large on the planet that uh, you know, the majority of people wouldn't even engage the acknowledgement that their mum has done anything wrong to hurt them in the first place. Yeah. Then if they had done that, which some do, you know, you go to therapy or whatever and that process begins, obviously, usually it's justified. You know, like mum had her problems, so she dumped her problems on me and you know, nobody taught her how to love, so what can we expect? Yeah. There's a lot of justification before you've actually processed through the emotion. Yeah. Right? But let's say that doesn't happen and mm -hmm. you actually get to process through the emotion. The emotional pain is pretty intense going through if once you start connecting to what people have done to you, yeah. the emotional pain is pretty intense. And if you're doing it without God, you've got to have a lot of confidence in the law and, and, the, and just let yourself go through the emotion itself. Yeah. Now, this is what a person on the natural love path will do yeah. under, with the law of compensation if they don't involve God. Now, obviously, if you involve God in that process, God, once you're willing to feel the emotion, God can reach inside of you with God's love and basically pull out the causal th damage that was done to you in that moment, mm -hmm. right? Rather than you having to have this long process of, of, you know, crying and crying and crying until you no longer remember the damage. Mm -hmm. 
God can reach in and actually take out the, re the real causal damage that was done. And for many of us, the causal damage that was done were, were things like worth and other things like that. So God can reach in and give us some worth by then giving us love. And then we realize we're loved and we realize that God's our mother and mm -hmm. th that our mother isn't really our mother. They just made our body. And we go through all of these truthful realizations in that process. Now, that's with regard to forgiveness. So we can speed up the process of forgiveness of other people, too just like we can speed up the process of repentance yes. if we involve God. Right? Does that make sense? But we have to be, in both cases, emotionally open to going through the emotion. Mm -hmm. That's the important fact. And if we're not emotionally open, we are shutting down our soul emotionally, and therefore the emotion will not flow, and God's love also cannot flow and heal us. Mm -hmm. So, So... Either way, we have to feel emotionally to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Either way. Now, with repentance, it's the same. Right? Okay. So just that's for to, forgiveness. Just a little bit on forgiveness. Identical. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. So with the forgiveness, um, it's actually the transmission of God's love that brings us a truth, an emotionally truthful feeling that assists with the removal of the cause. Um, not only that, God's love itself removes the cause. Yeah. Because it because it has the effect like a balm, if you like, like yes. a yes. Uh, like a soothing ointment over the cause itself, and and it heals it. Yeah. It heals the cause rather than us always feeling the effects of it, which is our crying. Our crying is the effect mm -hmm. of being harmed, and where our allowance of our crying is really important because uh, if we're not allowing that, then we're not even coming to recognise that we've been harmed. Yeah at that point. Yeah. So that, that's a problem because that means we're not recognizing the sin. Remember yesterday in our discussion, we said that we have to recognize not only the sins of our own, uh -huh. but also the sins of others. Yes. And so, you know, this is a process we need to go through. Recognizing the sins of others is a part of the forgiveness process. You have to first have an awakening to the other person's sin before you can forgive them for that sin. Yes. And Just like you need to have an awakening to your own sin before you can repent for your own sin. Yeah got to mm. okay so on repentance yes if we've heard the teachings of the divine truth we're starting to see wow i'm sinning all the time mm -hmm. i need to repent for this in order to heal my soul mm -hmm. and a lot of people have this kind of inward focus i just want to have a better soul condition yep. um but some people genuinely start to feel remorse for what they've done to other people mm -hmm. and they say okay i know i've heard that Repentance is about being willing to feel the pain that I've caused other people. I'm just going to be really humble and I'm going to feel all the pain that I've caused to my partner on my own and not involve God. Yes, I feel again that's probably impossible because to do, pardon me, to do it on your own requires you to have a full recognition of the truth of how much damage has been caused to, in the, in the example you gave, your partner's life. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, for the average person, they, they have no, they're very self-centered and self-centric, self-absorbed. And so it's almost impossible for them to see how an action they've taken has harmed another person's life. Yeah. They're only worried about, generally, about how other people have harmed their life, right? Mm -hmm. so, so getting from that state into a state where you truly recognize the truth is going to be very, very hard without God's help. Yeah. And this is why the, uh, the law of compensation takes a long time for people because it, it, it eventually they arrive at that conclusion. But many times it's only after hundreds or thousands of years of living in the hills, wondering why they're there in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, to, and then they realize they must be there for a reason and then they become open to that reason and then they have an awakening to the sin. Yeah. And once they start having an awakening to the extent of the sin, then they start going through the, re the, the, the repentance process, the crying process of what they've done. But that's still not involving God in the forgiveness and repentance law. Uh -huh. That's just a process where they've become aware and they have to work through their issues. That's the penalty-based pain and suffering that has occurred that they have to feel and eventually release. And that's what is meant when it means in the pageant message when it says you remember it no more. Mm -hmm. The emotional memory of the pain and suffering you've caused is remembered no more. You still remember the event, but you do not remember the emotional part of the event anymore because the emotions have all been dealt with. Of course, in that big process, you do remember how long it took you <laughs> and how painful it was <laughs> to go through the process of remembering. Yep. 
and and then forget eventually forgetting but but obviously that's still a very slow process but again the emotional connection is required whether you're on the natural love path or the divine love path mm -hmm. in order to do that. Mm -hmm. So the emotional connection is required no matter what you do. <laughs> so give up the idea that the emotions is just about the divine love path. It's not. No. The emotions are required when you do any progress whatsoever. <laughs> yep. Your emotional release is going to be required from you. Now, the beauty of involving God in repentance process is that once you're willing to go through these emotions and you have a sincere feeling of, of desiring God's forgiveness for what you've done, recognizing that actually a lot of what you've done can never be paid for mm -hmm. and never be compensated for because, because you've done things that cannot be reversed. For example, you might have uh, killed someone when they're very young yeah. and you got you got to have your life on earth and there's no way you can give them a life on earth no. is there no, there's nothing you can do actually to give them back an opportunity that you've taken away that's right and only god's love can give them that back that opportunity they can go back up to the soul union condition and try again if they wanted to mm -hmm. but it's only god love god's love that allows them to do that yeah. so 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 the reality is once we have a true recognition of the seriousness of sin we we realize wow there's nothing I can do to really fix this problem mm -hmm. for the person that I sinned against or for the creature I sinned against mm -hmm. or for the environment I sinned against. Mm -hmm. And, and all I, I am now reliant on God's love to fix that particular thing. And once you recognize this reliance, then you understand how important the relationship, or one of the, way, it's one of the ways you understand how important the relationship with God is. And so is a part of repentance, true repentance, coming to God and saying, I can't fix this stuff I did wrong. Yes. Can you please? Yes, definitely. This is why people stagnate in the sixth sphere as well, because they have not come to terms with this concept that they need God in order to, they need God's help to actually fully re reverse the the actions and, and thoughts that they had and their actions that they took as a result of those thoughts. They need to God's help to reverse it, mm -hmm. not for themselves, because they might have reversed it already for themselves, mm -hmm. but, but for others that they've harmed because they have no control over those others. Yeah. And, and this is when you start realising that both the seriousness of sin and secondly, uh, which, so, so that will cause you never to justify it, right? Yeah. But secondly, it will also you begin to see how important God is in redeeming you from sin because without God's help, it's impossible to fully pay all, for all of the damage and and it's definitely impossible to fully reverse it yes all of the only god's love can fully reverse all the damage and bring a person back to all of the possibilities they had at the beginning before you harmed them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um just lost it sorry yeah it's, no, it's fine um so part of repentance is very much this god there's so much god reliance and, and an honor of god's power in this very process of repentance true repentance yes and in fact it's quite arrogant to believe that you can fully repent and reverse all of the things you've done without god's help yep. because it's actually a physical and it's also illogical because it's a physical it is a physical impossibility without god's love nothing can be made pristine again yeah and so it's, it's you can have all the natural love in the world but you are not going to be able to fix all of the damage and the results of all the damage you've ever done yeah. as a result of that natural love. It's only through that person receiving God's love that the damage is actually repaired. And so obviously that person receiving God's love is very much now under their direct free will choices. Y yes, and this is one of the <laughs> things you realise that, wow, you don't even have control over that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is pretty heavy. Mm. Um, so what impact, though, does say I want to repent, I, I'm coming to God, I'm saying, oh, wow, could you please help this person who I've harmed? Please, could you love them? Mm -hmm. What effect does that prayer, in effect, that repentant prayer, have upon God's because isn't God already trying to help that person of course 
Yeah. God, God's not motivated in, in that prayer to help them more. Mm -hmm. But what happens, though, is this. Your openness to the fact that you have sinned against them creates an emotional openness in that person towards recognising that you have sinned against them. Yeah. And therefore, an emotional openness in that person begins to develop uh, towards f forgiveness, if, if that makes sense. It does. So, so you, you imagine if two of us are next to each other and you tell me that I've done something wrong towards you and I go, no, I haven't. How dare you say I haven't, all those kind of things. You know, and I, I right, ridicule you for thinking that I have done anything wrong, whatever. If I go and do all of that, then, then obviously that's going to make it very hard for you to even recognise the sin in what I've done, mm -hmm. right? So you, you, you might be getting attacked by me and that's going to make it even more difficult for you to recognise the sin of what I've done in most cases. Yep. Now, unless I acknowledge the sin emotionally, obviously it's going to be very, very hard for you. You're going to have to go through a very difficult process to recognise that I have actually sinned against you. Mm -hmm. Now, it is possible, of course. That's, uh, you know, I had to do that all the time in the first century, so it's possible. Yeah. But it's going to require a lot more strength of will on your part yeah. to recognise the sin when you're still getting sinned against by the person who's doing, who, who sinned against you previously. Yeah. And, and so obviously, if I, it, just my desire to stop sinning mm -hmm. right, against you and my acknowledgement to you that, I've stopped, that, I, that I want to stop sinning against you, and, and my acknowledgement that the, my past actions have been a sin is going to help you in your developing awareness. Yeah. Now, now that you've developed an awareness, you have a choice. You can either go through the law of compensation process or with God through the choice, but that's your choice. I can't influence that choice. I can encourage it, yeah. but I can't, I can't make you mm -hmm. make the choice to go through God's way or the natural love way. But but I can influence that choice quite a lot by my emotional openness. And I don't even have to talk to you to influence that choice because my emotional open openness to the fact that I've sinned against you automatically creates a feeling inside of you that something has changed, that you're not getting bombarded with my closed behaviour and my, my justification of the sin mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge benefit. So when we pray also, for God's love, for, for the person to become open to God's love, and we pray for that person. Obviously, um, our, our prayer in itself is a desire, a pure desire, that will be felt by the person. Yes. Now, this particular prayer, as, since it's felt by the person, causes the person to begin thinking and feeling things that they haven't thought before or felt before, mm -hmm. which also will obviously assist them to work their way through the issue. It also encourages, let's say the person under normal circumstances would have no divine love spirit surrounding them. Let's say under these circumstances, the person that we've harmed has no divine love spirits around them. Mm -hmm. My prayer for them that they are, you know, that God's love will eventually be able to heal the person is actually going to be, be cause spirits in the spirit world who, are, who have received God's love. To, to be more consciously aware of that person and trying to assist that person. Yeah. And that's, that's also an effect of our prayer. God, in effect, says to those spirits, I would like you to take notice of this person who also needs help because this person over here is praying for them. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so God directs those particular helping spirits uh, to helping the individual. So now there's a higher likelihood of the individual not only going through the process of awakening to the to the sin that I've committed against them, yeah, but also having uh, wanting to go through it with God, uh, because they're surrounded by spirits who will help them understand that process. Yes. So yeah. there are a lot of benefits to the prayer for the other person about the other person. Obviously, God has an intense desire to um, do all things for other people, and God Himself or herself is not. Um, limited by our prayer. In other words, God, you, if you pray more, it doesn't make God change God's principles or laws no. or anything. Yeah. Um, and God was already doing as much as God n can do given the law yeah. for the person. But, but the human component is changed by mm -hmm. your prayer. Mm -hmm. Your own will is changed. The expression, their open, your openness now to that person has changed. Their openness to receiving other information has changed, and quite a number of factors have changed, which will naturally cause the person to 
uh, go through uh, an awareness process generally. Mm. Mm. So from what you're saying <coughs> really, um, our sincere repentance is the most powerful thing we can do to remedy a situation with say a child or a spouse. It's better than bringing them flowers, it's better than writing them long letters that just come from our head and not our heart acknowledging what we've done. It's better than buying them. Mind you, you might do all of those things because you're sincerely repentant. <laughs> of course, but if we don't, from what you're saying, if we don't engage that repentance process, um, there is, because of the lack of acknowledgement of truth coming from us and the continued desire to sin, there, there's less openness for that, for that person themselves to open up to the truth and yes. change their free will choices. Yes. Bear in mind in all of this that uh, one of the worst sins we can commit is to treat another person as if they are superior to us. And many parents have done this with their children. And many, many partners have one person who does that to the other in the, in the partnership. Yep. Now, these are quite significant sins. And if the person who's on the receiving end of the sin decides right, to, to no longer allow, the, uh, to develop an awareness, go through the process of repentance and so forth, the person on the receiving end will no longer allow the person to believe they are superior. This of the other person yeah. is superior. Yes. As a result of that, the other person is going to be severely challenged and angry. So, mm -hmm. so it doesn't mean under all circumstances that um, there's going to be this immediate fantastic <laughs> outcome. No. Because the person is going to have to go through emotions where they do believe they are superior and, and coming to terms with the fact that they are not. Yes. And, and so you can see under that circumstance that the outcome might be quite traumatic for that person for, kind of, for some period of time. And in fact, that person is likely to get angry and resentful. Mm -hmm. And the person who's been harmed by it may have to withdraw from the people involved. Yeah in order to demonstrate love to them. Yes. Right? In order to no longer feed their addiction of superiority or their addiction for glory or their addiction for attention. Mm -hmm. and, and so this is where the majority of people don't understand the full ramifications of not sinning. Yeah. Because they feel sinning is harming the person but, but not, not realising that actually you, when you treat another person as superior to yourself, you are harming them. Mm. And, uh, and, and, and that has all sorts of ramifications. Yeah. And also has long term effects on them when it, when you stop treating them as superior, the other person will continue to believe they are and will try to take action mm. uh, believing they are. And obviously the person who used to believe they are inferior now would need to stand up for themselves and probably withdraw from the situation. And the person who believes themselves to be superior will probably think that the person who's inferior is doing the wrong thing yes. <laughs> in that yeah. process. Yeah, got to. Yeah. What I'm reminded of when you're talking about this shift when a person repents for their sin, be it that they've made someone feel superior or, or they've inferior. been... Or inferior. Yes, yeah. making someone feel inferior. It's sort of like when you're in a really, really noisy room and you get accustomed to it and then all of a sudden the noise stops and something's shifted dramatically and you think, wow. Mm. Mm. So for the person on the, who you've been sinning, sinning against, when you make that soul shift, that's sort of what it must feel like for them in that suddenly there's a shift in the space around them a and shift that, that they may not like or they may like. Exactly. It just depends on the circumstance. But it will bring a, a, a different awareness to them. Of course it will. And then they have a choice. Of course they yeah. do. Yep. Yeah. So this is the powerful thing about us actually repenting. Yes. And remember, prayer is desire. Mm -hmm. a, a desire in harmony with love is prayer. So, so obviously if I have a desire in harmony with love and up until this point in time I've treated you like your superior, then my desire and harmony with love would need to be exercised to treat you as equal. Mm -hmm. And obviously that would create a shift emotionally. From The emotion coming from me will be different. Yeah. And if you're addicted to the previous emotion that I'm inferior and you're a superior, then obviously you will be severely challenged by that emotionally. Yeah. 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 But the shift will cause a, sh a shift, obviously. <laughs> and my desire to pray for the other person obviously will cause a shift. And, and there are many helping spirits who will help as a result of that. Yeah. Now, obviously, the fact that I've prayed is also a factor. If you don't pray to help somebody, then I would question whether you sincerely have a desire to help somebody. Yeah. Because obviously you recognise that only God can help them because you can't. And this is also why it has an effect. Because the reality is before you pray, 
the reality is you don't really care about whether they helped or not. Mm. Yep. Mm. And, and once you pray, you now care. Yeah. And your caring is what motivates God also to do a number of different things. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, our next question was... Can I just say, it motivates God because God's acting on your behalf. Okay. See, when you pray, you're asking for God to act on your behalf. You, 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 you recognise there's something that you would like to do, but you can't, that, you, that, that it's impossible for you to achieve, and only God can achieve it. And you're basically asking God to act on your behalf. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, God responds to those prayers. Now, up until that point in time, God won't respond. If, if, you're, if God needs to do something on your behalf, God will not do it unless you have a pure desire for God to do it. Does that make sense? It does. And this is why prayer is so effective, because, mm -hmm. because you're asking God to act on your behalf. Yeah. And, and this is an acknowledgement of God's power to do so and your inability to do mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. And this is a wonderful thing from God's perspective, because God, God's now, to, do, to actually ask, you've had to believe that God actually has the power to do it. Yes. You've had to come to know some things about God that you didn't know before. And you've also had to come to some awareness of your own humility uh, that you didn't have before, yes. recognising that it was impossible for you to do some things. And that's why you need to ask God to do them for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really challenging, that injury of self-reliance, working yes. through some of that and saying, look, God, you are the guy who can do these things. I, I, I really it's not, can't It's not just it saying that to God. It's requesting of God that God acts on your behalf. And this is, uh, it's very important that people understand this, that it's requesting that God is acting on your behalf. Until that point, God is acting on God's own behalf towards the person. Which is loving. Which is already loving. Which is doing a lot of things already. Correct. Yep. But God cannot act on your behalf because you have not requested God to do so and God only responds to your free will requests. Yep. Right? So God cannot act on your behalf. God can only act on God's own behalf mm. towards that person. Right? Now obviously there's things that God can do on your behalf right? that, that, are, that are going to require emotions from you uh -huh. that God is waiting for you to engage before God can do those things for the other person on your behalf. So can you give us an example of what something like that might be? Well, let's say I have killed somebody. Um, I can't get the person back. The person's now in the spirit world. Who knows what condition they're in? I've taken their life. And, and even if it's accidental, I, I, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I can't restore their life to them. I can't restore them to their family. I recognise that their family are now missing them. Mm -hmm. The person themselves now missing their family, although of course they can see their family, but they still miss them mm -hmm. because they can't communicate or interact very well with them. They miss their life on earth. They, they are going to, miss, going to miss out on experiences on earth that they would otherwise be able to have. And, and in that process, when I come to realise what has happened, even if it was an accident, I realise the extent of the damage and how much I can't do anything about it. Now, once I come to this awareness, I can actually engage God in this process of repentance, but also engage God in prayer to help those particular persons that I've harmed through my in, even inadvertent action. Mm -hmm. and, and God can only act on my behalf when I request God to do so. Because mm -hmm. it, it would be wrong of God to act on my behalf if I have not requested God to do so. Right? So, so, so if, for example, God would be trying to help the person already. God's already, all of God's laws are constructed to lovingly assist the person. But God can't open the person to my emotion. Mm -hmm unless I am open to my emotion and desire God to open the person to how I feel about them. Yep. God can't do that. Yep. God can't do that side of the equation. So this additional prayer would have the effect of? Of if my heart is now open, I see the enormity of what I've done, the person who I've affected and, and the people who are surrounding that person who I've affected will now be more emotionally open to seeing what's being done and therefore emotionally feel what's happened rather than just trying to shut down the feelings and trying to absorb it and trying to get on with their life, which will all help them to heal from the situation. And if they do that with tears towards God, then God's love can even flow into them and they can be completely healed from the situation where there's no harm done at all. Mm -hmm. 
but only if God's love flows. So you're saying that your prayer, I feel so repentant, I feel sorry, I would, God, can you please act on my behalf to... You to wouldn't be saying it like that though, would you? No. <laughs> because you'd be crying and you'd be... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just sorry. Throw it, just play the concert. I can dramatise if you like. <laughs> no. Um, You're fairly resistive in this conversation, darling, so... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm in a bit of physical pain myself. Um, yeah, okay, good. I think they got it. It's you fine. Think so? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think it's quite clear that when we request to God, of God to do something on our behalf, and it's a sincere, heartfelt request, then obviously God will take actions to do it on our behalf. Just yes. like any friend would. Yes. So, so they, that sincere, heartfelt feeling of repentance might cause God to, a, a guide might come to that person in the spirit world and bring them to you in your repentance state. Well, no, I think the thing you don't get is what I'm trying to convey, and that is my own, my own desire for God to act on my behalf in itself has already yes. opened up some soul-based communication between myself and the people I've harmed. That's and and then God can use that situation with the laws that God is constrained by, yep. which God made, of course, yep. which are all loving. Yep. And God can use that situation to assist the person even further yep. in a way that they couldn't, he couldn't have done before because I have blocked it from occurring. Yes. I have purposefully made an inbuilt choice to block it. And my prayer opens that yep. pathway. Yep. My prayer is the doorway, if you like, to God being able to do those particular things. Yeah, yeah. no, that's clear. Uh, it's like the shouting in the room ceases and suddenly there's a soul-based interaction that's enabled to occur between the person who's done the harm. There is, but it still may not occur. Mm -hmm. And if I have a prayer that God has assisted occur, then you'll be surprised what can happen after that. Okay. Where, where now God can ask spirits that help that person to influence the person on our behalf. Yeah. To, or attempt to at least communicate with the person on our behalf in order to uh, even open a dialogue that yeah. wasn't there before. Yeah. And, and it's amazing how many times I've prayed in that way only to have an instant communication, uh, oftentimes instant, uh, but usually within the next day I have a communication with the person I've prayed for. Yeah. And, okay. and, and this happens all the time because you've opened the pathway for it to occur yeah. through your request. Very beautiful, mm. yeah. Before then, you weren't expressing a desire for it to occur. Yeah. And, and God obviously wants to satisfy our desires, but God's not going to satisfy the desires that we don't express. Yeah. God, you know, if we don't feel our desires, God, there's no desire to, that God can satisfy. Yeah. We need to feel our desires in order for God to satisfy them. Yeah. And if our desire is loving, God will act upon it, yeah. always, always. Yeah. God's a loving friend, just mm -hmm. like a loving friend would act upon it if he had the power. So God does. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Is, I think you've really demonstrated how essential God is in this whole process. Yes, and in our assistance group program, obviously we've got two, the last two presentations about God and also our love of God. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these, these are kind of concepts that we'll be discussing a lot about, you know, that how, how prayer can influence uh, influence things in the universe to occur because uh, it opens a pathway for them to occur and we're asking God to act on our behalf yeah. uh, whereas before um, God, can, God cannot act on our behalf if we do not request God to do so mm -hmm. God only acts on his own behalf before that point yeah 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 yeah, yeah, cool. Not that that's only. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> that's obviously a huge thing. Yeah. But but obviously there's more that can be done because of our openness emotionally now that God couldn't do before because we were not open emotionally. Yes. Because we didn't express the desire. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Got you. Okay. Mm. So our next question was why is it so important to involve God in repentance and forgiveness? And I think you've pretty adequately covered that. Maybe we say? can summarise it. Yeah. The main reason why we must involve God in repentance and forgiveness is because we recognise during the process of repentance and forgiveness that it's actually impossible for us to fully compensate for everything we've done to harm another. And it's probably going to be nearly impossible for us to feel the harm of every, that everybody else has done towards us without God's help. Yeah. 
Yeah. And under those, you know, not, I say nearly impossible, people have done it, but it is very hard. And so to do, to do these two things, obviously God is essential in the process and, 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 and God makes them much more, like, makes these processes much easier to perform as well. So obviously that's a great reason. A, se a second the, and just as important reason is the recognition of God's power. We do not have the power to reverse. We, we are not gods. We, we cannot distribute God's love. God's love is the only true healing force in the universe. Um, and when I say true healing force, people who distribute natural love, their own love, can only heal things to the sixth dimension. So it's not completely healed. The only true healing force in the universe is God's love. Only God has God's love. I cannot give God's love to another person on God's behalf. And once I fully recognize that and fully recognize the need for that to occur for full compensation and correction of all the things that I've ever done wrong, then I, I, I will see the essential part of needing God to do all of these things for me. And that's why I will need God in the process. <laughs> that's why it's so important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I just need to have a little break. Sure. Hey. All right. <laughs> Our next uh, question pertains to repentance. Mm -hmm. And it is, what place does a desire to repent have in my relationship with God? Yeah, a huge, to... a huge place, obviously. Yeah. Because if you think about it, if you can't repent about what you've done to God's children and God's environment and God's creations, then it's pretty unlikely you're going to come face to face with God because, God, you know, from God's perspective, you're still harming his other creations. So obviously repentance is, a, is very important in establishing your relationship with God. Without repentance, you are not going to be able to establish a relationship with God at all, in fact. And so you can actually become to have an awakening to, of the sin but unless you're fully repentant and engage God in the repentance process, you're still going to be very, very damaged in your relationship with God. Mm. Mm. So if I don't have any desire within me to repent, can I even connect to God? No, of course you can't. It's impossible to because the process, the repentance actually draws God's love to you. Repentance is your feeling of truth about the situation. So you, you, you actually feel the truth about the situation of what damage you've done you know, towards others or yourself or the environment or any other thing. And you feel it, and that's the feeling of truth about it. Now, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, so that spirit can't connect to you to, in order to become the conduit through, through which God's love flows unless you are repentant for what you've done. So, so you, know, you can't receive God's love unless you are repentant. So very important part of, of mm -hmm. your process and progress towards God is becoming repentant. Mm. So remember, repentance and forgiveness are, are all about sin. They're all about the recognition of sin and so forth. Obviously, once we've released all sin, uh, we've released all blockages between ourselves and God, obviously having a desire for God under those circumstances is much easier, but, but obviously still something that needs to be personally developed. Mm -hmm. But um, repentance and forgiveness are essential for a person who is sinning in order to have a relationship with God mm -hmm. or who has sinned in order to have a relationship with God. They must go through a process of repentance. Mm -hmm. and, if, and if other people have sinned against them, they must go through a process of forgiveness. So in the first century, I had to practice forgiveness all the time, all the time. And, and many people sinned against me and I had to forgive them in order to maintain my relationship with God. So, so even once you're at one with God, you will consistently practice forgiveness of others. Mm -hmm. You will no longer need to repent because you've now removed all of your own sin, but you still will need to forgive others because they may sin against you. You may catch up with people who are not at one with God and they'll sin against you for sure. <laughs> and you will need to forgive them. Mm -hmm. And so after a while, forgiveness becomes a fact, a way of life for you, in fact. Mm 
Mm -hmm. and you come to learn how to forgive instantly, just as God forgives instantly. It doesn't mean the person feels the sense of forgiveness that you have, just like the person cannot feel God's forgiveness unless repentance has occurred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the next question was, what place does a desire to forgive have in my relationship with God? In and other I think words, I pretty much answered that yes. too. It, uh, it has an in intensely important rela uh, process with God. And it, forgiveness, unlike repentance, is going to need to continue beyond you becoming at one with God. Mm -hmm. so, for, so repentance will cease once you've become at one with God because you will no longer personally sin. However, that is no guarantee that other people will not sin against you. Mm -hmm. And forgiveness then will become something you need to have as a, as a constant companion for the rest of your existence. Mm. And the more you associate with people that are in the hells or in the first sphere or any sphere up to the seventh, the more you will need to practice forgiveness. <laughs> yeah. uh, so essentially, are you saying that unless we have a desire to either forgive or repent or both, we cannot create even an initial connection with God? You need to have a, a desire to repent to create the initial connection with God. Mm -hmm. but, and, and obviously on the things you repent for, you will begin to establish a connection with God. You've, you've come to awareness of the sin. You're asking for God's forgiveness. And, that's all about, and, and obviously that means that you've now established the beginnings of a relationship with God. However, a relationship with God cannot continue while you refuse to forgive others. And, uh, and so that is something that you realise after a while, you, that, that the process of forgiving other people is very, very important and in fact essential. And, and if you want to become at one with God, you must learn to forgive others as soon as they've done something wrong against you. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be an instant forgiveness of others. And, and, and in fact, that's how God forgives others instantly. And that doesn't mean, like I said, that the other person feels the sense of forgiveness, mm -hmm. right? And they, to feel it, they must repent mm -hmm. <laughs> themselves mm -hmm. in order to be forgiven and, and to feel the sense of forgiveness. But they will feel a change in attitude towards them, which will trigger some of their forgiving, the, pro the process of forgiveness, potentially depending on upon their use of will. Right. The process of repentance or forgiveness in the other person? You said uh, you repentance in the other person yeah. will be triggered by your forgiveness of them yeah. because they will feel a change towards them from you yes. and they will feel an openness towards them from you as yeah. a result of that change. They will feel love coming towards them from you rather than anger or resentment or other emotions. And as a result, that will cause a change surrounding them mm -hmm. to be triggered into some kind of reaction. Now, the reaction will depend upon how they use their will. Mm -hmm. They'll either get angry with you or they will w use their will in a more loving manner and actually go through the process of repentance, uh, awakening to their sin and then repentance for their sin themselves. Mm -hmm. But that's their possibility. Excellent. Mm. <laughs> okay. So the next question I think you've covered also, mm -hmm. which is, if there's nothing we can do to fix the people we've hurt, is there any way that we can help them? Of course. So I've talked to about to the work. fact that God can fix them. Mm -hmm. So this is our be the, the beautiful thing about recognising our own insignificance in some ways is that actually we recognize that the most powerful being in the universe has the power to fix everything we've ever done but cannot cannot and will not do so unless the will of all those people are involved mm -hmm. so so one of the primary wills obviously that needs to be involved is our desire to have it done it, because that we are the person who's committed the sins mm -hmm. now obviously it's very very important that we engage God in that process. And, and so I feel it's essential to come to recognize from both a logical and an emotional perspective that only God can repair everything that you've ever done that's out of harmony with love. You can't repair it yourself. The effects of it are long standing. They can last for thousands of years or even tens or hundreds of thousands of years. And in the case of the first human couple, we are still the human race is still paying the penalty for their initial action. Imagine the enormity of that. Mm. Imagine being in the situation where the action you took 
has affected billions and billions and billions and billions of people generation after generation after generation after generation and knowing that you can do nothing about it although you started it you can do nothing about it and this is the same as people like you know who have taught religious falsehood on the planet they get to the spirit world they recognize the truth of certain things that i've taught that were not true when when they taught them and they go, what can I do about it now? I've got, I've got masses of people on earth, millions of people on earth following this doctrine or this teaching. Mm -hmm. What can I do to repair it? I, I, like only God's love can repair those particular things. Mm. And that's why we, we are in desperate need of God's love. And it's also why it's such an important process to come to acknowledge and ask God to do things on our behalf, recognizing that we are incapable of repairing those particular things ourselves. Yeah, mm. yeah, very important. Mm. Okay, what are some of the reasons why we would refuse or have no desire to involve God in repentance or forgiveness? So, well, the, the, they're really only, they all boil down to one reason, really, and that is the, the desire to be self reliant in some way. So, you, usually there's a number of emotions that may cause us to be self-reliant. One group of emotions are to do with guilt and shame and personal punishment. So in other words, we desire to not engage God's help because we feel so self-punishing that we don't want anybody to help us. We're just going to, we're basically going to live in this cycle of self-punishment and attack and abuse of ourselves in order to avoid the, the process of God helping us because we feel so bad about ourselves and we feel that we cannot be forgiven. And, and that's not true. It's not true that we cannot be forgiven. So we're, we're obviously not facing a truth that we can be forgiven and we need to emotionally face that truth. So that's one reason. The other reason is almost the opposite to that. And that is that we feel so superior and so, you know, uh, like better than everyone else. And so much better than most of our peers that we believe that we don't need God's help at all in order to forgive other people or repent or do any of these other things and in fact usually if we believe this we believe that actually we don't need to repent for anything either much and and uh, and uh, you know everybody does things to us and we've got to forgive them all the time <laughs> we have a very superior viewpoint of all of our interactions with other people generally when we have that attitude but both of those things are the exercise of self-reliance, not wanting to engage God in, in a process. So, so we could say that the main reason why we don't engage God in a process is because we're unwilling to feel an emotional injury that t tells us that we shouldn't engage God in the process. And we're unwilling to engage that particular emotional injury and feel it. So it's quite simple to fix. All we need to do is find whatever that emotional injury is and feel it. And then we will probably engage God in the process. And, and so and I would recommend to people that they are the kind of emotional injuries that you want to find very, as your very first ones, if you can. <laughs> and often they're not the very first ones because you've got to go through a lot of awareness first before you realize that you want a relationship with God. But, but if we can resolve these particular injuries that we have with God, then obviously it will simplify greatly our progress and our development and also our happiness, our progress towards happiness, if we engage that particular process. If we refuse to do so using our will, then obviously our process will be long-winded by necessity, mm -hmm. by necessity caused by our own desire or will. So you mentioned the issue of self-punishment mm -hmm. or wanting to... Is that an issue of having a desire to forgive oneself? It's a refusal to forgive oneself. Yes, yes. Isn't it? And, and, and we've got to find a reason why we refuse to forgive ourselves. And when I say forgive ourselves, the process of forgiving ourselves also does involve repentance because we need to come to see that actually holding on to a lack of forgiveness of oneself is causing much more damage in our life than we realise. So in other words, we need to see the sin of not forgiving ourselves. So how that's affecting others around us. Yes. In, when we are self-absorbent in that regard, 
We, we intensely affect other people around us. We do and act and say, and, re and we also reject love quite significantly. And so therefore no one can love us. So we're rejecting love, we're rejecting truth. And so it is a significant thing that we're doing to damage ourselves if we're in that self punishment, in that self punishment phase. We need to find the reason why we're doing it. We need to feel the reason why we're doing it. All we need to do is feel it. Once we've felt it, then the reason will be gone and you'll have the opportunity to engage God's way rather than your own way. Mm.